Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Gabor Lukács. I'm the president of Air Passenger Rights, and this is our Sunday update on air passenger rights in Canada. I would like to welcome you to the show today, and uh, I would like to start with thanking our team of volunteers, uh, Christine, Terry, Dominic, and Martin, who are always with us and helping us through the week with your questions, with making sure that the group is being run smoothly. I'm also uh, checking now and I'm being told by Martin that uh, we have good audio and video, so we are good to go. And hi, Maria. Hi, Carol. Hi, Tennis. Uh, we are probably uh, just going to wait maybe a couple of seconds until everybody else joins. And then we are going to get right to uh, the meat of our discussion. We have a quite packed agenda for today. We are going to be talking uh, not only about the usual uh, routine stuff, the routine updates, but also I decided to bring in perhaps a session on how the European regulations work with specific emphasis on the issue of refunds and to help you understand how and when those European rules apply. So that's the that's a special item for today. And also we are going to have some discussion about what the travel industry looks like and going to look like in the coming weeks and months. There are a number of uh, airlines and various tour companies that are trying to entice you to uh, purchase travel services from them. We're going to have some uh, words about that, whether it is or isn't a good idea. I am uh, just wondering from my team if they could give me a reading also on the numbers. Uh, then, uh, then let's uh, start. Uh, our first uh, point is, as always, coming back to our successes in the media, in the social media. This past year, past a week, sorry, uh, we issued an open letter to the government signed by five other consumer protection organizations in Canada from coast to coast, uh, including the option from uh, Quebec. They have been very, very active on the front of refunds. Uh, the uh, Consumers uh, Association of Canada from their base in BC. Uh, the Public Interest Advocacy Center from Ottawa, and uh, and two more Quebec-based organizations. That letter uh, received quite a good coverage in the media, and I am very grateful for those members of the press who pay attention to our work and uh, have made an effort to actually mention it in their reports uh, on the development of this issue. We have also seen that the issue of refunds is not being forgotten. It remains a live item on the news. And in terms of uh, members of parliament, we have seen additional questions coming from uh, members of parliament, in particular uh, from uh, the member of parliament, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambarso uh, Nouvel, who has been a very vehement, supportive advocate for the rights of passengers to get a refund. And uh, it also made me think that perhaps outside Quebec, we should rethink how what we think about Quebec, what kind of image we have of Quebec, because we can see now that actually Quebec is the one province which is at, as a province has been standing up for the rights of passengers. The Quebec uh, Legislative Assembly passed a um, resolution calling on the federal government to enforce rights of passengers. And as much as I love Nova Scotia, where I'm living, and there are many other wonderful Canadian provinces, we have not seen yet a similar clear message coming from an entire province's legislature, province's legislative assembly, as we have seen from Quebec. So next time when you think about Quebec, perhaps you should think about, oh, these are the people who actually believe in consumer rights. In terms of uh, social media activism, we have had a number of successes too. Good tweets going out, uh, the efforts to hold the prime minister accountable for what is happening on his social feeds, on uh, the Facebook feeds where he, when he's talking live continues. And we are going to continue reminding the government that there are passengers whose money has been stolen by airlines. And we are talking about 
3.4 billion dollars approximately that has been stolen apparently with the government's blessing and uh, we need to continue that fight so if you so far have not created a twitter account yet do it now if you have not followed our youtube account yet do it now and find time if you can just a click or two to retweet a message to retweet uh, something that tells the government these issues passenger rights matter Canadians care about it um, the next point on our agenda uh, is flights to and from the United States. There are two uh, new developments which are somewhat intertwined. I'm going to start with the uh, moderate good news uh, that relates to WestJet. So um, one of our wonderful members shared with us this document that was recently released by WestJet to travel agents. And this is WestJet's new refund policy for flights to and from the United States and to and from the United Kingdom. So um, when we look at this document, uh, let's just get things right here. So the first thing to remember is that uh, this applies. So uh, they, are they are saying that they are graciously now able to offer the option for a refund to the original form of payment for guests who had a journey that included the United States or United Kingdom flight segment that was canceled by WestJet. So this now tells us that for anybody who even transited through the US, they will be able to get a refund. This is far from all the flights. This is far from solving all the problem, but this is a step in the good direction. And what we need to uh, understand is that the reason that WestJet is doing this, and I hope this also answers Maria's question, is because the United States and the United Kingdom have stringent enforcement of passenger rights, unlike Canada. The US Department of Transportation put out as early as more than two months ago, on the 3rd of April, an enforcement notice to warn airlines that they have to issue refunds. Or flights they had cancelled. Then on the 12th of May, they issued a second reminder and more elaborate FAQ to again hammer on the point that airlines cannot simply pocket passengers' money and give worthless vouchers in exchange. They do have to provide refunds. So that message with respect to WestJet seems to be sinking in now. And United Kingdom is not being as as a uh, visible in its efforts, probably they are doing things a bit more subtle in terms of visibility, but they also issued a very clear statement on uh, the Civil Aviation Authority's website confirming the clear and unquestionable right of passengers to insist on a refund to the original form of payment if they choose to do so. Um, now what WESIT is saying is that for people who were who were uh, flying um, who were flying uh, entirely domestically or in Europe or Caribbean and they preferred to get refunds, they claim that they are going to provide further information at a later date. Well, I'm wondering whether that uh, uh, later date means when hell freezes over. Uh, I hope not. Certainly, if it comes to me, if it's up to me, that date is going to happen very, very soon. Now, the European Union as a whole has stringent regulations, which is true. The question is enforcement. The UK has uh, quite a firm enforcement. I would expect that some of the next destinations that are going to ramp up some pressure will, we already know Spain is threatening to sue 17 airlines. I believe that uh, the Dutch government may be taking things more seriously. We will see. Germany, with Lufthansa, they, they are being a bit careful, but I think Germany may also be some of the next countries. Ireland is already taking a quite firm stance. Um, so it's really a question of timing, and uh, probably Wedget is also looking at, at which are the markets 
where people will react the worst if they don't get back their money. And probably UK and the US was from a very uh, Machiavellist, if you will, or a very uh, pragmatic approach, a good choice from WestJet, because probably people in the UK and the US will get the more most upset and are the less likely to book with WestJet. And people who have ties to those countries culturally have probably less less likely to uh, to uh, book with WestJet if they don't issue refunds. Now, here's another very troublesome aspect, which is that they provide here a kind of schedule about how much of a loan they're taking from you without uh, paying you any interest. So I, I find it really uh, uh, highly questionable that they think, WestJet thinks that they can actually make you wait until these dates here with uh, getting your refund. And even then, once you have that, they still want you to wait four to six weeks to get your refund. So here's what I'm looking, how I'm looking at it from a practical perspective. This, from a legal perspective, gives us very good grounds, including in chargebacks, to say, well, Wedget itself acknowledged that you are owed a refund. So it is not really a question of whether you are owed a refund, but rather when you will be getting a refund. And once the question of whether you are owed a refund is settled, uh, as in this case, then we can move on very quickly to uh, enforcing that right through uh, the process of chargeback. Because now, Wedget does not dispute anymore, cannot dispute that you are owed a refund. And with that in mind, if you call in for a chargeback and say, well, they are promising a chargeback, but only in three months from now, or a refund only in three months from now, I have a right to a chargeback right now because I didn't get the services I paid for, then the credit card companies are more likely to uh, give you a very quick, uh, almost immediate um, temporary credit. And, and it's quite clear at that point that those chargebacks are not likely to be disputed by WestJet simply because they have already admitted that this money is owed to you. Those four to six weeks are, of course, not, not acceptable. I would say, you know, five to seven days, business days is what would be reasonable. Given the circumstances, maybe 15 uh, days, work, uh, calendar days, so basically two weeks would be re within reason. After that, simply apply, do a chargeback. And Wedget cannot uh, set its policies unilaterally. It cannot just make things up as they go. They have to uh, comply with the law and the the i think the u.s department of transportation is looking closely at this i i think that i suspect that with this this was probably the most time they could buy to themselves with the u.s department of transportation so if they are really going to comply with this maybe and i'm saying just maybe wedget may be able to evade a hefty fine by the the um, u.s department of transportation but it doesn't mean that you have to wait that long if you want to do a chargeback and this brings me, of course, to the second uh, point, which is what happens with our wonderful um, national carrier, Air Canada, which, unlike WestJet, is not rushing to comply with the law. So to answer that, uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Simon Sear, our member and uh, uh, other, I guess I should call it, uh, volunteer complaint writer now uh, who came up with a perfect template to file formal complaints with the U.S. Department of Transportation against Air Canada and against other delinquent airlines, Canadian airlines, uh, that refuse to pay what is your money. So those airlines that refuse to give you a refund, given that the U.S. Department of Transportation made it perfectly clear that you are owed a refund. So uh, I hope that that link is going to be posted as we are talking. Um, there is already um, a, a whole post by Simon, which explains uh, how it works, the process. And I would like to stress that I'm talking here about the US Department of Transportation, not the Canadian Transportation Agency, and that uh, I'm talking about a formal complaint, not an informal one. So a formal complaint is very much like a legal proceeding. The Air Canada will have to file a response to it and they will be facing some pressure because 
the US Department of Transportation then has to deal with it on the record. It's not just calling up, making some phone calls in the background politely. They will have to, to actually hand down formal decisions to uphold the law. And the number of complaints that they will be receiving, which I'm hoping is going to increase against their Canada in particular, which I seem to be most uh, combative with when it comes to refunds, is going to force uh, and the, the authorities in the US to take a swift action because it, uh, if we can show that Air Canada is as egregious as it is, if it, if it has some paper trail, and mind you, with the US Department of Transportation, uh, those um, complaints, as soon as you file them a day or two later, the complaint shows up and it becomes public. So if all of a sudden there are 100 complaints from Canada, all against Canadian Airlines, it will be hard for the United uh, States Department of Transportation to, to not do anything, especially with perhaps very few complaints against formal complaints against their own airlines. So their own airlines will be then pushing uh, the Department of Transportation to go after Canadian Airlines. I'm seeing here two questions and I'm going to, to continue from that point on. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, I was wondering if uh, my wonderful team would be so good to also post a link in this discussion um, to, oh, it, it was just posted, wonderful, thank you. Uh, there's just a lag, so thank you, Martin, for, for posting that link. Now, I would like to answer two questions we had so far. Dolores is asking, any news that Air Canada will be giving out refunds? Last time I heard, they're going to be giving out gift certificates that will never expire, but no refunds. So Dolores, uh, this is going to be a long battle but we are going to win eventually. There is no doubt that Air Canada will ultimately have to give refunds. Why? Because it is the law. They cannot steal the public's money. They cannot steal money that belongs to you. What they are doing right now has a name, it's called theft, and sooner or later, one form or another, there will be accountability. If they are lucky, it will be in court. If they're not lucky, may happen in other forums uh, if they continue this kind of anarchist behavior, which is a complete disregard to the rule of law. I, I, one thing that people don't appreciate in decision position, that undermining the rule of law is playing with fire. It's a very dangerous thing. In Canada, we are very fortunate to have a public consensus that we respect the law, we respect the rule of law. But if the government upsets that find balance, that, that, that faith that the public has in, in the rule of law, in, in the fact, in the a belief, a confidence that laws are there and they have to be obeyed, then it will be first and foremost the uh, people who are pushing for these decisions, who own corporations, large corporations, who will be losing if Canada turns into a true anarchy, which is where things are heading at least when it comes to travel by air. Uh, so we are working on it. There are a number of class actions that are ongoing. There are a number of efforts, political as well. The way refund will be coming, Dolores, is by us keep putting the pressure. Keep putting, a, keep pressing, not letting the topic to be forgotten. Keep it in the media, keep it in the public agenda. The, being the broken record, being the squeaky wheel, will result in eventually things being resolved, resolved one way or another. Uh, Neguet is asking, what is the value of email vouchers sent to you when you uh, asked for a refund? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, those email vouchers are really not a proper form of refund. What you need to be refunded is whatever you paid. It has to be refunded to the original form of payment. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'm not clear on your question, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, next question, Lori Rice is asking, should we complete a formal complaint with the DOT if we have already filed an informal one and haven't received a response yet? Lori, there is no rule against filing a formal complaint if you haven't received a response to the informal one. And I would say that at the current situation, filing an informal complaint is very quick, but you know, we, we are seeing with Air Canada that it's not really effective. So what I'm suggesting that now we shift the strategy, we shift gears, and each one of you who hasn't received a refund from Air Canada, if you had a flight 
to or from the United States, now go and file a formal complaint using Simon Sears model, using his, his uh, template as a sample. If we manage to reach, you know, a couple dozen formal complaints, it is already going to lead a red light because I was looking at how those complaints are coming in. And before we started this, there were something like 50 some complaints in the queue of the DOT total, I understand from the beginning of the year, as it seems. If now all of a sudden there will be several dozens in a matter of a few days or a few weeks, that is going to get their attention. If you manage to get a couple hundred, that is definitely going to get their attention. And all of a sudden, there's going to be Air Canada, the main big bad guy, which is the DOT is getting so much complaints that I expect some of those complaints will get joined together. But it is a way of actually raising attention, drawing attention to the issue that we have an airline which not only disobeys Canadian law, but also disobeys US law. And ultimately, if they continue this attitude, perhaps the US Department of Transportation should suspend their license to fly to the US. It would be a very extreme step, but it would certainly be an interesting thing to see how things pan out. I don't think it would get that far, uh, but those formal complaints help a lot, especially against Air Canada, which seems to be playing you know, hardball now with passengers. And once they are forcing the U.S. to pay, that will be the first sign that we are moving in the right direction with Air Canada too. The long battle, mind you. And Air Canada has a history of not being exactly the most rational or most fair with passengers. And Maria is asking, where and how can we complain to the EU about airlines not respecting their regulations? Maria, with respect to the European Union, it is state by state. So each state has a national enforcement body, an NEB. And the European Union has a, a PDF with all the national enforcement bodies for each state. And you can complain to the body uh, that uh, from which airport you are supposed to depart or where you were supposed to land if you're coming from Canada. And that body has some jurisdiction um, to deal with complaints. It varies from state to state. It differs from state to state. Uh, it is a bit, I would say, awkward. Uh, certainly not as efficient as the US Department of Transportation. What I'm seeing as a takeaway from this, although I'm not sure the European Union is moving in that direction, but what Europe should have is a more unified approach to transportation by air and for this type of air complaints. But that's a different matter. It is what it is. Uh, filing a complaint there is, is no harm. Just some states are more efficient than other. Uh, uh, I'm seeing another question by Neguyet. Uh, do email vouchers sent to you way in during charge rec when you only ask for a refund? When you when you are given a voucher by email, the first thing to do is to write back if you can at all. I don't accept it. I want a refund. So. They can offer you oranges, but if you order apples, you just make sure that it's clear on the record that you don't accept those oranges and you want still apples. That's, that's the way to deal with it. Uh, uh, MasterCard made it clear in the documents we discussed before that the merchant cannot force on you something that you don't want. You paid for a ticket, they can offer you instead uh, you know, a nice lamp a nice car and motorcycle or vouchers or a gift card, whatever they want. But you as a customer, you as a cardholder, hold the discretion to decide whether you accept what they offer or not. And in this case, in the case of vouchers, you should decline the offer advising that you don't accept vouchers. You insist on your right to a full refund to the original form of payment. So just to wrap thing, this point up, with respect to the United States, flies to and from the United States, Please take a moment to complete that uh, formal complaint and follow Simon's guide. Uh, Simon has also been very generous with his time and willing to help you through the filing process, through uh, ensuring that, that, that it's properly filed. It's not that difficult. Uh, it certainly uh, will be taken seriously by the United States uh, Department of Transportation. It will get posted publicly. So uh, it means that the airline cannot just bluff, oh, we are really being compliant, oh, we are being so good. They have to 
deal with those complaints. They have to pay a lawyer or a law firm. They're already paying a law firm there to deal with this. And they will have to explain somehow in coherent terms to the United States Department of Transportation why on earth Air Canada is not complying with the clear requirement set out by the United States Department of Transportation for refunds. And I am really looking forward to seeing those explanations. Those will be due, the first ones I think are due sometime in late May or early, uh, late uh, June or early July. And I cannot wait to see what Air Canada is going to say in terms of their explanations. So please join this collective effort. It takes just a couple of minutes to do it. And uh, it is a way of registering the issue that is a large scale issue happening. I, I mean, we're also looking a little bit at, uh, at uh, the comments. Next topic I would like to mention is, um, is uh, the issue of future travel. We now see that the borders are starting to open and airlines are all crazy to offer you various discounts, better deals. Just please book with us, give us your money and we promise we'll be good. I'm very cautious about those and I suggest you to exercise a lot of caution when you read such offers. They may appear very lucrative, as much as 20% discount. Uh, Dominic recently wrote a post about it. I hope he's going to just post it also soon. Um, more, in reality, it's more like 14% off only, but it doesn't matter. Even if, even if someone offered me a half price ticket now, uh, I would be very cautious and hesitant to buy it. Why? because it seems to be operating like a Ponzi scheme, like a pyramid game. They are going to take your money and perhaps use that to refund passengers who haven't flown already. But what happens if there is another wave of coronavirus, which is bound to happen until there is a vaccine? What happens if for whatever reason they decide to cancel? Well, what we have seen with Air Canada is that they are not going to give you a refund. They are going to try to keep your money, pocket your money, without actually giving you a service in return. So when you look at those uh, various tempting offers, I would urge you to think twice, to resist the temptation. It, it reminds me the, the, uh, old, uh, the old joke that um, I think my coming out from, maybe even from my uh, late grandfather, Holocaust survivor and the, 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 the rabbi's dilemma, uh, it's pork and it's for free. So, um, as you know, pork is not kosher. So um, the, the point is, it may look like the best deal, but actually it's a Ponzi scheme type of setup. You give your money, they may be using it for various purposes and you have no guarantee that you are going to see that, back, that money back or get something in return because of how the current government is not enforcing the laws in Canada. It is dangerous. I see here a question about from Tanya. When would you suggest considering to book travel from Canada to Europe again? Which airline companies have the best refund policy and which have been the quickest to respond during this crisis? Tanya, it's a, you're asking a very good question and uh, I don't have a methodic, precise answer um, to this question, uh, I would say uh, that we have seen which, which airlines have been worst. I would say Air Canada, Air Transit, Sunwing, they have been absolutely atrocious and I would not book with them if I can help it even later, even when this whole COVID-19 is over, unless and until they make some very clear and firm commitments for the future that they are going to behave differently and until such time as they have refunded everybody who are whom, to whom they already owe money. And so in terms of when it is safe to book to Europe, you know, Tania, I have a 92 year old grandmother in Hungary. I would absolutely love to see her face to face. I'm afraid that I may not be able to see her again in person because by the time it may become safe to travel, she will not be here anymore. However, I'm still not hopping on a plane, even though I'm really, really craving to see her because I don't think it's currently safe. It's not simply a concern health-wise of what may happen on the plane. 
In that department, I would say that the airlines are understanding some of the issues and are making at least some genuine efforts. Whether they are sufficient or not is yet to be seen. That's a scientific question. But there is also a question of what happens if you get stranded somewhere with health issues, if you do catch COVID-19, what kind of health care you will get there? How will you get back to Canada? And the other part is the financial question. What happens if you buy a ticket hoping to travel and then there is a COVID outbreak in that country, flights are canceled or not, and what will happen with your money? Insurance companies have already proven, many of them, not to be reliable, not to pay you by finding some kind of excuses, making some kind of excuse why they don't pay. So I would say probably this summer, I would forget about Europe. I would, I would Canada is a wonderful, beautiful country. Even traveling within Canada is currently somewhat restricted between provinces still for a good reason. But I'm here in Nova Scotia. If I if I really urge to travel, personally, I don't. I, I'm, even now, I can tell you, uh, we don't go out with my partner. We don't go out during the day, pretty much. Or I have gone out once or twice for a bike ride, but staying very much away from people. We don't go to, to malls. We don't go to shopping centers. We avoid any possible contact, physical contact with other people um, because uh, it is still risky. Nova Scotia now, has very few cases, maybe one case report today, but we would like it to keep it that way. I think that we are going to be really safe in terms of travel only once there is a reliable vaccine and a cure. Even then, it could be a very nasty disease. We know that COVID-19 has some, could have some long-term effects on one's body, one's uh, various functions, various organs, but at least that way, it's not a death sentence. So, um, I tend to answer your question, Use lots of caution. And if you really want to go on vacation, probably stay in Canada. If you're in Canada, every province in Canada, Canada is one of, in terms of uh, its, its uh, travel industry, it has amazing things to offer to you just in a couple tens or hundreds of miles from your house. You don't have to go to the other side of the world. I mean, I'm here in Nova Scotia, and, and uh, when you get in a car, drive maybe 100 to 200 kilometers. And there are amazing landscapes, amazing things to look at, amazing parks. Um, if you want to, you can drive to Cape Breton, and that's absolutely fantastic in terms of the what it has to offer. And each province is the same, so um, there are there are alternatives. The bottom line is traveling now is risky financially and health-wise. It is going to get better health-wise, hopefully, in terms of the finances. I would like to hear more from the airlines. I would like to hear clear guarantees, clear uh, promises, clear policy changes uh, from a number of airlines before I would recommend traveling. Um, the next point I would like to, to discuss, it's, it's a, the special edition for today, is a discussion on the European regulations. We have spoken about it a lot, and I'm bring it up right now as we are talking. So we have spoken about it a lot, but we have never gone really through it, so maybe it is the time. Um, this is a, reg a regulation of the uh, European Parliament, is more precisely the, the European Parliament and of the Council. So uh, although it is called a regulation, actually, when you look at its nature, it is more like a statute, a primary legislation passed by the European Parliament. They have lots of preambles, and if you, you know, really uh, want to look at it from a lawyering perspective and, and a statutory interpretation, of course, all those are very, very interesting. But for the purpose of our discussion today, I would not look at those too much, I, because they can help a court in interpreting the intent of and, and the European Court of Justice relies on those preambles. But in practical terms, when you, when you actually go have a claim, uh, you will uh, just you will likely uh, be relying on the actual provisions of the regulations. So I would like now to take you through some of the key structures of how it works. Um, uh, Article 1 is more, mostly a kind of statement of purpose. I haven't seen it being used much. 
Article two is definitions. That's a very important uh, part of any statute because you can have the best possible statute, but if your definitions are really wonky, then you are not going to get too far. So it defines what an operating carrier means. It defines what a community carrier means, and uh, it defines what a reservation is, what a ticket is, what your final destination is, which is being used. Uh, it defines also what cancellation means. Cancellation means a non-operation of a flight which was previously planned and on which at least one person was reserved. So in Europe, no, there is no nonsense when it comes to, oh, we didn't cancel this flight. Oh, no, no, no. It was just a scheduled change. Well, no, in Europe, a canceled flight is canceled. If the flight did not operate, it was canceled. The next thing which I, uh, which have, uh, we have had some discussion about it already before, is the scope of the regulation. In other words, to whom does it apply? Uh, the um, regulation has two types of people to whom it applies. One, passengers departing from an airport located in the territory of a member state to which the treaties, the treaty applies. This also includes uh, countries from the uh, European Economic Area, EEA. They have also joined some of those regulations. So under A, any flight departing from the European Union, whether it is Air Canada, WestJet, Sunwing, which it doesn't matter which nationality it is, it, the regulations do apply to it. The second group of airlines, the situation in which the regulations apply, are passengers departing from an airport located in a third country to an airport in a territory of a member state to which the treaty applies unless they received benefits or compensation and were given assistance in that third country and there is a caveat here if the operating air carrier of the flight concern is a community carrier. Let's make sense of this. If you go, I'm going to draw somewhere. So if you go from the EU to somewhere, then you are good. And if you go from somewhere to the EU and the airplane or the carrier which operates that flight is an EU carrier, then you're also good. The only time when you're out of luck is if you go into the EU and you travel on a non-EU if you travel on a non-EU carrier then you're out of luck this, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm using, I guess I'm used to mathematical symbols. This means non or negation, mathematics. I, I cannot, I'm, I'm betrayed by my mathematical ancestry. So uh, this is in terms of the application. And what this means for you is that if you have a flight, say a return portion of a, of a flight from Belgium back to Canada, if that flight is cancelled, these regulations 
will be applying to you and your rights. Now let's see what the regulations actually say when your flight is canceled. So cancellation is handled, is, is provided for by Article 5. In the case of cancellation of flight, the passenger concerned shall, now shall means obligation, be offered assistance by the operating carrier in accordance with Article 8. I don't want to deal with everything else here because all we need for the purposes of refund is Article 51A. This already tells us that whatever happens, you may have additional rights, but you certainly have the rights under Article 8. The airlines will typically tell you, oh, we don't owe you a refund uh, because it was uh, extraordinary circumstances. But let's be clear. The provisions about extraordinary circumstances, that's Article 5 sub 3, relate to compensation. Let's again look back at the words. The key word here is compensation. Well, in the case that we are talking about Article 8, you always have that right. The right for assistance under Article 8 is unconditional. You have it regardless of what caused the cancellation. While the right to compensation is conditioned on uh, whether it was something which was not extraordinary circumstances. You don't need to worry about it because all you're asking is a refund. You are not asking for compensation. Now, in, in case you remember those days when you were programming in, in BASIC, I, I still have quite vivid memories of those. Um, you, you, know, you may remember those go to commands where you tell the computer to go to a different line number of the code. So when you see a situation like this where they, a statute is telling you that you are entitled to something in accordance with Article 8, you have to think, interpret it as a go to command. What it means is once you reach this point, go and read Article 8. So let's go and read Article 8. We're scrolling down to Article 8. And Article 8 is dealing as we want the right to reimbursement or rerouting. And it says that when the reference is made to this article, the passenger shall be offered. So shall means an obligation. It's not, it's not a, a may, it's a shall. It's, it's a mandatory language. A choice between the following three. And what we care about is item A. In item A, it is reimbursement within seven days by means provided in Article 703 of the full cost of the ticket at the price at which it was bought for the parts or, or for part or parts of the journey not made and for part or parts already made if the flight no longer serving any purpose in relation to the passenger's original travel plan together with when relevant. This is also you have a right if necessary to go back to the point of departure free of charge. What we really care about in this context here is, of course, the refund part. It is, uh, it is the part about your right to a refund. And there we go. So it tells you how the refund has to be provided and what has to be re refunded. So how is described by Article 7 sub 3? The what is the full cost of the ticket at the price at which it was bought? Now we are again at the go-to moment. The statute or the regulation in this case is referring to a different point, a different provision in the uh, regulations. 7 sub 3. So now we need to scroll up and find 
7 sub 3, it's not that far, actually, far apart. Because I'm just going to make sure that you see it. Okay, so here's seven, Article 7. Most of Article 7 deals with right to compensation, but Article 7 sub 3 describes and actually prescribes how the compensation has to be provided and how the, how the um, refund has to be provided. So when a reference is being made to, uh, to Article 3, it means it has to be made, shall be made. It's not just made, shall. And it has to be made in cash, by electronic bank transfer, bank order, bank, or with the sign agreement of the customer, it can be made by trial vouchers and other services. So the law under the European regulations is that unless they have a sign agreement from you in which you explicitly agree to accept vouchers as a form of compensation, um, then you are entitled to a refund to the original form of payment. So far is our review of the European regulations. Of course, there is a link which is posted and this video will also be posted. You're welcome to uh, go through it once more, to go through the, the technical bits and pieces. But next time that someone is telling you some kind of nonsense that Oh, actually, uh, because it was such an extraordinary circumstance, you're not owed a refund. Now you know exactly how to respond. This is exactly uh, the, the response. The law is on your side. Last point that I want to talk to you about, continue talking to you about, is chargebacks. It is an ongoing project, and I was very happy to see this week, finally, seeing a number of people winning their disputes with finality. It's great news and I thank you for those who share those with the group. It gives us hope and it shows that all this work that we have done is for a good cause, for a good reason, we will eventually prevail. At the same time, we are also facing some roadblocks. We have, we continue to face roadblocks with some of the uh, um, credit cards. Um, I'm, I'm seeing I've seen a number of uh, complaints specifically about Rogers MasterCard. I have seen two cases that are specific to them. If you have more cases with Rogers MasterCard, um, feel free to post it. Uh, I am, because I saw only two cases so far, I'm still holding back on putting out a, a call for any case of complaints, but I think that something is wrong, going wrong there. I can tell you we have already been in touch with Mastercard International. I forwarded to them some recordings of uh, the problems with uh, Rogers Mastercard, and I would like to give them a little bit of time to take it as a training opportunity to fix the situation before uh, we go full Gabby on them. So. Uh, I, I would suggest a little bit of a few days of patience. Uh, if you have, I, I, so far, two people with the Rogers MasterCard contacted me and it is being looked at. I would say if by the end of next week things are not sorted out, we will be looking at further steps because it is unacceptable that Rogers MasterCard is going, decides to just take the law into its hands and ignore the law, ignore even their own franchise's rules and just make up the law as they find it fit. That's not how the world works in Canada, and they may need to be reminded about it. Um, the other problem that we are seeing is American Express. American Express has not been cooperative, and uh, we are trying to reach out to them to ensure that they understand their obligations, but suffice it to be said that I'm aware of the problem. I've seen a number of people with Amex uh, in the, in the uh, help for credit card charge VEX queue. Those are not problems with deadlines, which is the reason that I'm not prioritizing them as 
top immediate urgency to drop everything else. As you have seen, I, people who do have 24, 48 hour deadlines, I try to respond whenever I can, whenever my time permits and write to them and help them write a letter to the credit card company uh, to explain what happened and why the, the, the airline's uh, dispute is invalid and why the chargeback has to be issued. But Amex is something that is on my to-do list, on my list of concerns, and uh, we are going to uh, do something. It may not happen as in the coming days, but I didn't forget about you. If you have an Amex problem, I am thinking about you and I'm working on it. It's just Amex is a different structure. They are themselves, the, both the bank and the issuer, while normally with MasterCard or Visa, you have a credit card issuer and you have the franchise, the MasterCard or, or uh, Visa International. So it's a bit different structure, different relationship, and it may require a little bit more work, but I do have a contact and, and I do have some ideas of what to do there. Um, the ultimate choice that can may have to happen with Amex if they are not being completely stubborn and unreasonable is simply clawing back the money and forcing them to take us to court if they don't like what we are doing as passengers and say, well, it's not a legitimate charge, I won't pay it. I'm trying to find alternatives to that. It is a last ditch solution. Uh, I believe in trying to work things out amicably. They should not have any business interest in this under normal circumstances. For them, it, it, they are just an intermediary. So they should start understanding that uh, they may be losing lots and lots of uh, customers if they are not going to respect the law, not going to respect the rights of uh, Canadian consumers, Canadian passengers to a charge back when they didn't get the services they had paid for. I'm going to answer now a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, we are. Uh, so David F Fuller is asking about Air Canada claims it doesn't apply to them. Uh, we realize you may disagree and view this approach as inconsistent with EU 261 regulations. However, as a Canadian carrier, we cannot be required to follow a legal regime that is in exact contradiction with its own national laws, following fundamental principles of international air law. Well, David, I think Air Canada was going to be up for some quite nasty surprise there because uh, it's just a matter of time that they will start facing some significant legal challenges in all the European uh, countries, your European jurisdictions. It may not happen right away, but I would I would be surprised if, especially places that that uh, have some right wing xenophobic uh, feelings in in a culture. I'm thinking particular of Hungary, where I'm from. Uh, I would be surprised if if they would tolerate much an airline uh, which says, well, you know what, we don't care about your laws. Uh, it, it, it can irk people's nationalism. And uh, perhaps if you, if you have this kind of experience and you speak the language in the local country, complain to the national enforcement body, share with them what position Air Canada has been taking and that they think that, that the European law doesn't apply to them. And, you know, see the back and watch the show. I suspect that Air Canada's uh, belligerent attitude eventually is going to buy them back in the rear. Uh, Aaron Kim is asking, um, he, he, he's mentioning that Roger MasterCard closed my dispute because it's a non-refundable ticket. Uh, after I spoke to a supervisor, I was able to reopen the dispute. What next if they closed again? Well, Aaron, if they closed again, we are going to have it reopened again. The, the point is, I suggest you don't pay the bill. They try to rebel, you don't pay it. You know that you are right, it's your money. They have no title to the, your money and they have to respect the fact that you have your rights. They, they cannot take the law into their hands and, uh, and just ignore that it is your money. So if they want to have a piece of paper which says if you owe them so many hundred dollars, well, they can have the piece of paper but still won't have your money. And if they want to vindicate themselves that you actually do owe them, they will have to take you to court. I'm not suggesting to take such a combative attitude if not absolutely necessary, but keep in mind, it's your money, not theirs. Credit card companies are building on your uh, good behavior, which I of course recommend normally to follow, that you will pay uh, at the end of it each month the bill. But if they don't follow the law, if they try to take money from you that doesn't belong to them, you can claw it back and they will be stuck with things that are unpaid. And if they want them to see their money, will have to take you to court. I checked in Ontario actually 
collection agencies cannot harass you. In Ontario, if you tell a collection agency that you want them to take you to court, they have to stop harassing you. They have to stop contacting you. They have then either to throw up their hands or take you to court. Their Ontario laws are quite good in that regard. I suspect I didn't check each Canadian province, but in most Canadian provinces, the laws tend to be similar. Uh, those collection efforts are good for situations where you don't clearly dispute that you owe the money. In this case, you say, I dispute this, I don't owe that money, I don't recognize this is a valid transaction, and let's, let, let, let's let the judge uh, sort it out. Have a good day. Pat Agri is asking, what is the response if a credit card company states we are not accepting or are withdrawing your charge rate request because the airline is offering vouchers? Uh, Pat, with respect to MasterCard, there is a clear response that the MasterCard International requires them to open disputes. They cannot impose vouchers on you. So if you have a recording of you being told something like that, with MasterCard especially, forward it to me and I can pass it on to MasterCard International. And the ex past experience shows that something will happen. Some kind of talking to uh, the people on the other end will be happening. Ultimately, I would put the request for a chargeback in the writing, send it to their legal department or otherwise whatever official address you have. And if they are not responding, if they're, if they're still maintain their stubborn attitude, claw back the money. Just don't just deduct for your next bill. Deduct the amount that of the chargeback and say I've already paid for it. It's not a legitimate charge. I pay, overpaid previously, so it's a set off. And if you don't like it, so what? Take me to court. I don't recommend doing that until you have tried everything else. Not because it's not legal, but because. The way that we deal with things here in Canada is trying to work with the companies in good faith as much as possible. Uh, the credit card companies uh, themselves are kind of caught in between. They just need to see the light. They need to understand that you have a clear legal right here and sort it out with the airlines. Claire is asking, do you know if in Ontario law is like BC where a merchant cannot issue a voucher with an expiry date? Claire, excellent question. I don't know it by heart, but um, if you post this question in the approval queue, I can try in the coming days to look it up. I'm, I'm not a lawyer in case you, you didn't know and I want to clarify it. And certainly I'm not an Ontario law, consumer law expert. Uh, this type of uh, expire dates on prohibitions on vouchers has been quite widespread in Canada, not just in BC, they, I believe, my memory. They have similar things in uh, in uh, Quebec. I recall seeing similar things right here in Nova Scotia, and I would suspect that you will have similar things also in uh, Ontario. It's just a question of where. But if you if you want, you can just Google you know um, gift card Ontario. It is going to give you a, a starting point at least. Miriam uh, Doyland is asking, uh, does it matter time wise one way or the other? Whether we should follow up with a credit card company if we file a chargeback and don't hear anything back in all, pe in all period. Is there a certain amount of time we should wait before ch checking back? Well, uh, depending on your province, there is a certain amount of time in which they have to deal with chargebacks. It's in the law, for example, in Ontario and in uh, Quebec. Uh, I don't remember the law by heart in, here in Nova Scotia. But if, if you have a chargeback which is statutory, depends on the situation, um, then you can hold them to that deadline. And if they don't do anything, I again, claw back the money and advise them, I'm taking back this money because I gave you a notice of chargeback. You've done nothing about it until now. And therefore, I assume that it has been accepted. And if you don't like it, do something about it. So I, I think that the, the part of it is, is a, an attitude of hold your ground. We are talking about your money here, not their money. If somebody comes into my house and they want to take my property, they have to have a darn good reason for being here and a darn good legal basis for touching anything which belongs to me. Short of a court order, probably they will find that my doors are locked and if they come in, I'm going to use reasonable uh, force to protect myself and my home and my property. The same thing applies to you when someone is trying to take away your money. It is your money, not theirs. Tim Willems, if you refuse to pay the amount on your credit card, will they 
take it to collection or will they take us to court? Tim, uh, sending things to collection is a verbiage. And for many people who are not as well vested in the law, it may sound scary. Hi, I'm a debt collector and you owe us so much money and plus interest plus this and plus that. Okay, fine. But is that person a judge? No. Is that person a police officer? No. So it's no more than now we have upgraded it to someone with a bigger voice, a more uh, abrasive style, and perhaps less inhibitions in being rude. A collection agency can do many things if you are acknowledging owing the money and not disputing it. As I mentioned, in Ontario, there is a specific regulation dealing with collections. And first of all, if someone tried to come to me here in Nova Scotia and collect any money from me, my first question would be, sir, are you licensed as a debt collector or as a, in, uh, in Nova Scotia? If not, well, I guess I'm giving you five minutes before you, I call the police. If I ever see you again here, I'm going to have you arrested. That's, that's the kind of, I mean, maybe you cannot get them arrested realistically I, um, because it's not an arrestable offense. Although if you, they come to your land, you can trespass them for sure. But the point is that if somebody here in Nova Scotia tries to engage in, in debt collection without being licensed, they can be subject to a complaint and they have no sense of humor about that because it's a licensed profession. It's something that is, has some regulatory oversight. The other aspect is that in Ontario, if you tell debt collector in a writing, it proved maybe a registered letter. I am disputing this amount, this debt. Take me to court. They can no longer contact you. There is a specific regulation in Ontario that says that. So you can force them to take you to court, and in court there will be a judge who is impartial, and you will say, "Okay, I didn't receive anything for it. I tried to dispute it with a credit card company. They ignored the law. Here are all the documents. They have been just sending me pro forma templates. Clearly, they are not doing their job." That's probably not going to where things are going to end for them. May Lou is asking, CIBC Visa had told me it could take the merchant 30 to 120 days to dispute the chargeback. I believe Visa International said 30 days. What is the correct amount I should hear if there is a closure to my case? May, um, I believe Visa International did publish some relaxed timelines because of the COVID-19 pandemics. You may want to look at all the Visa documents we have posted in our document archive at docs.airpassengerrights.ca slash credit cards. You will find there under Visa. They were given a bit more time, but you also have to look at your provincial legislation. How much time does the province provide the credit card companies to process those? Um, I will give them a little bit, maybe a little bit leeway, but 120 days strikes me as a little bit excessive. Andrea MK uh, is uh, asking, uh, what are the rules regarding wedges vacation packages? I verified with the hotel they don't get paid until the reservation is complete. DEL, I guess, Delta returned money to the airline. Um, all our money was forced into wedged dollars, which cannot be used toward taxes and fees, but almost thousand dollars in taxes and fees in, of money they got. Well, uh, I would say, Andrea, this is a time for chargeback. You paid for something, they didn't provide it, you have to get it back. Simple as that. It's a case of services not rendered. We all we are all sympathetic to various merchants that weren't able to provide the services, but they still have to give you a refund. Um, Janice, Janice is asking regarding good faith effort to get a refund from the airline before processing to a chargeback. How much effort is enough? I have two messenger requests that KLM brushed off. Should I get a recorded call as well? Then it's, uh, it's really, I'm learning now as I'm dealing with those chargebacks time up and time again, that having those uh, chats on which are printable, uh, visible chat transcripts are great. I don't think you need to go and ha set a hunger strike before KLM's corporate offices to make a good e faith effort. You communicate to them your request to get a refund. They refuse. You have been refused. Move on to chargeback. If they genuinely want to issue you a refund, they will just not dispute the chargeback. If they do dispute the chargeback, here's a proof that they don't really have a good faith intention to give you a refund. So there is a requirement to make a good faith effort, but if they are being um, dismissive, as long as you have some 
record of it. I mean, all your recording is good, but if you have something in writing, hey, all the way better. It's easier to attach to a dispute, maybe convert it to a PDF. There is your perfect proof. I, I, I told the airline, I would like to receive a full refund because those flights weren't delivered, those flights were canceled. They said, well, sorry, our policy is otherwise. You maybe want to write back just to keep it things, but the European law says that you have to provide this and with, say with KLM, it's writing your terms and conditions that you will abide by European law. They will say, well, sorry, but this is a difficult situation. You may want to have a bit of back and forth, but ultimately, if you remain clear in your communication, I don't accept vouchers, I reject your offer to provide vouchers, I insist on my right, to be provided with a refund as required by law, then there is your perfect transcript. Um, we, are, we are now past our one hour originally intended for uh, this uh, show. I'm just going to maybe take half a minute to see if my wonderful team of volunteers today has uh, another uh, question or anything that still has to be answered. If not, then let's remember this is not over until we have won. So uh, we are going to continue advocating, continue fighting, continue making it clear to the airlines that it is your money that they have stolen, to the government that they are endorsing theft, to the opposition that we are grateful for their support for Canadian consumers, for Canadian passengers, and for standing up for our rights. So uh, I think this is a good point to stop. Have a wonderful week. Remain safe. Observe social distancing. And at the same time, try to spend time with your loved ones within the means that are available in the current situation. I will see you next week.